Jeremy, thank you very much. Well, I'm joined here uh, by the last Labour Prime Minister, Lord Callaghan, who came into office, uh, didn't fight an election to, as Prime Minister except to lose it. But, uh, but you did come into office abruptly. Do you, what, what do you think is going through Tony Blair's mind as he, without any experience at all, you were quite experienced in politics when you went in, is about to form a new administration? Well, I, he's shown such maturity, I think, uh, and um, grasp of the uh, whole situation that I have uh, little doubt about uh, his, his worries. I, and I don't think he will be particularly concerned in that sense of whether he can handle the situation. What I am sure he feels, as I guess every new Prime Minister feels, I remember I felt it, I left my officials at the door of the Cabinet Room and I walked in and by myself and they shut the door and I stood by the Prime Minister's chair and I felt then, and uh, I, this may sound sententious, but it's absolutely true, I felt I was a trustee of all that was best in Britain's history and a, a leader for the few years that were going to be given to me. And it was a solemn moment in that sense. And I sat down and there was a white telephone there then that was supposed to connect me directly with Moscow for the nuclear deterrent. I see that's disappeared now, I'm glad to say. And um, I rang the bell and then the business started. You see, number 10 is not a home. It's an office with just a, a flat on top. It's basically an office. And that is why all the brutality of the sudden ins and outs has got to take place. And what would your advice be to him in general? I don't mean about his administration or his policies, but in general about handling the civil servants and the, all the pressures that he'll suddenly find himself under, quite different. I mean, however great the pressures of reorganizing the Labour Party, and goodness knows they must have been quite severe, this is something altogether different. I'm not sure the pressures are going to be as great as all that, you know. I, uh, I, I felt in some ways that being Prime Minister was easier than being, for example, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, because you have your own people, and provided you let them get on with the job, they do get on with it. But as to what, how you should handle it, uh, I think we should destroy what has been suggested many times, that the civil service will try to uh, carry him in some direction. Tony Blair has shown himself determined enough and bold enough and clear enough, and provided he tells Robin Butler and the rest of them what he wants to do, they will carry it through. But of course you didn't have to do this other business of a day and a half on Europe, which John Major says he's been doing with Amsterdam coming up and all those negotiations. Now that kind of foreign negotiation, well, constant, we did constant pressure, different? I, I think it was, well it wasn't a constant pressure because I enjoyed it. I mean I used to think to myself, good heavens, they're paying me for doing this. Uh, but uh, Or traveling abroad. <laughs> yeah, well, not traveling abroad, but being prime minister. Right. Right? It's absolute heaven to be prime minister if you know where you want to go, even if you don't get there. But so I, I think we had quite considerable journeyings and these international negotiations went on then. We invented the G7 after all. And so uh, in terms of a newcomer to the international stage, you think he'll take that in his stride too? I mean, somewhere this is going to prove yes. difficult for him, isn't it? This, well, of it's course not going it to be is a, a sort of happy ride for five years. Well, of course it's going to be difficult. But, you know, I'm, he's, a, I think, a remarkable young man. He's fought a most brilliant and bold campaign ever since he became leader of the Labour Party. And it really isn't as difficult as all that if you've got the self-confidence that he's got and the knowledge and background that he's got. I have every confidence that he, within three months he can find himself uh, as though he'd been there for three years. But uh, as Macmillan said, there's always events. Of course. And that is, you see, when people talk about the thinness of the Labour Party programme, um, I think that is an advantage for the Labour Party because they haven't over-promised. Uh, and with a sceptical public, uh, with a, a, a relatively few promises that I believe they can achieve, then if they can do better than that, and I think they probably can over a five-year period, absolutely splendid. I think it will help to lessen the scepticism of the public and, and really restore a little confidence in politicians, which is what Anthony King and others have been talking about. We're looking at uh, John Major's car there ah. in, the, in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace behind you. Ah. What were your feelings when, uh, when you left the palace having handed in your resignation? You, of course, knew, I mean, rather as he knew he was heading for victory, you knew you were heading for defeat, didn't oh, you, in your yes. election? <laughs> you see, when I became Prime Minister, they only gave me... Oh, there he is coming up, you see, um, with his wife, uh, who's really done a good job. She really has. But, um, you see, they only gave me a few months in office. I, the the, 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 the bookmakers started betting as soon as I got there that I'd be out by September. <laughs> I'd beat them by three years. 
<laughs> and uh, but what were your feelings when you left? Well, if, you, if I must confess it, it was because of the winter we'd had, it was one of relief. Um, I remember saying to my private secretary, Ken Stowe, well, I haven't been able to solve this. I came in determined to reverse the, the, the uh, adversarial nature of the relations and to, to try and get a consensus. I failed to do that. And I said to Ken, well, I hope Mrs. Thatcher can achieve it on the same basis. But of course, she decided to go an entirely different way. But the resolution took 18 years after you left until this moment when the, the next Prime Minister after you will be going to the palace for Labour. Yeah, I, I think, mind you, this has been a dam waiting to burst. I think we could have won the 1992 election, but somebody had to. Somebody had to convince the, the British party, the British people that they could trust the Labour Party. And this is what Tony Blair has been able to do. Um, because I think, of course, the longer the dam is heaped up, uh, the greater the pressure, and therefore the bigger the majority. You're talking to the man who led the Labour Party in that 1992 election. Uh, I don't Neil, see him. Neil oh, Kinnock up there. Good morning, Neil. Hello, Jim. You've been doing well on this programme, too. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've all shown remarkable stamina. I'm quite astonished at you. Well, victory has that effect, Jim, as you yes, understand. But right. well, this is like 1945, but in spades. Yes. And uh, uh, there are many young people today who will remember it as we remember that great day in 1945, just as excited, and it will colour the whole of the rest of their lives. What Jim was saying is actually very accurate in terms of... Uh, what happened in 1992. Uh, you may have heard me saying continually that the changes that we made were unfortunately too slow and appeared to be too shallow before the election. They looked to the general public as if they were opportunistic uh, and cosmetic, whereas actually they were deep-seated. And what I had to say to the Parliamentary Labour Party after the election was that time will be on our side. It will demonstrate that we are worthy of trust but we needed longer to do it. And as Jim says, uh, Tony has shown that we are trustworthy, that his party is trustworthy in the most superb fashion. Neil, I don't want this to sound like it did between Michael Hesertine and Michael Portillo last night, but I think we must all say that you did a wonderful job in turning the party around and getting rid of those awful militants who'd taken over so much of the party in the time I was there. And I think we all, will all owe you a great debt. Thank you, Jim. Well, I think we can all go home. <laughs> um, not, no, certainly not. I'm just beginning to enjoy myself. <laughs> but but you, 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 said, you said, Lord Callaghan, that Labour could have won in 92. If what? Um, if, the, if the people had trusted the Labour Neil Party. Neil Kinnock? No, well, Neil, of course, was part of it, yes. But no, it was a case of trusting whether the Labour Party right. could, be, could, could do the job, and they didn't. And I think... Tony Blair's achievement is to persuade the British people that yes, they can be trusted. That has persuaded a number of Conservatives to stay at home, uh, as well as increasing our own vote. And I think we've now got five years, and although the economy, frankly, uh, truthfully, is not what it's been, we've been portrayed as, I mean, the whole question of sterling is far too high, and, and uh, the exporters are going to have great trouble in doing that. All these sort of things will have to be worked out, but I think we've got a good chance. Lord, Lord Callaghan, I hope you'll stay with us for a moment, if you will, because there are more events unfolding. Uh, the um, helicopter there over Islington, tracking um, Tony Blair's house, and his father, Leo, arrived a moment ago. His father, who wanted to be a Conservative MP and was a member of the Conservative Party in Durham, a lawyer whose illness when he was 42 was the first blow that struck Tony Blair as a young man, and his, as he himself said, pardoned him, put steel into him, now recovered. He hasn't been taking much part in this campaign, but uh, is said now to support, at any rate, to support new Labour and Tony Blair's Labour. And Hugh Edwards is down at number 10 Downing Street with news for us. Hugh. Uh, David, I'm just being mic'd up as we speak. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you good, fine. Good, good. That's marvellous. Um, amazing scenes here, a real buzz. Hundreds of people now getting into the street, lots of flag waving, people cheering. They know that Mr. Blair is on his way. At the moment, of course, imminently on his way to the palace. He will be here sometime around one o'clock, as we expected. The audience with Mr. Major lasted, what did it last, about 20 minutes. We're told Mr. Blair will last sometime in the region of 20 minutes as well. Some points to make, David, about the preparations in the building behind me the key jobs of civil servants. Now, I'm told that as far as 
some of the key staff are concerned. The biggest job of all, of course, in the private office, the office that runs the Prime Minister's affairs, the principal private secretary, a chap called Alex Allen. He's at the palace. He went there with Mr Major. He'll be waiting there for Mr Blair. He'll bring him back here. He'll introduce him to the staff inside. He will be in that job for a period of three months, after which they'll review whether it's working or not. And interestingly, that principle is being applied to all similar posts in these offices throughout Whitehall. The Secretaries of State will decide whether they like the staff they have. That's something they do normally, of course. But there is this three-month review period that seems to be being built in. The other interesting thing, David, at the moment, it shouldn't really come as a surprise to us, to do with a workload simply because they've got to get a Queen's speech with all the nuts and bolts ready by a few weeks' time. That means that over this weekend and the bank holiday, everyone is on call. The permanent secretaries, the big civil servants, on call over this weekend. On Monday, on bank holiday Monday, there will be some key committees working out what exactly goes into that Queen's speech. And that means, of course, that there will have to be some detailed briefings in all the red boxes for the secretaries of state over the weekend, not Monday or Tuesday, but over the weekend, because by next Tuesday and by next Wednesday and Thursday for the Cabinet meeting, they will have to decide on the contents of that Queen's speech. So to say that this coming week is going to be intensive, I think, is a bit of an understatement. Thanks very much, Hugh. Well, we're keeping an eye on the door of number one, uh, Islington, waiting for Tony Blair to come out on his way to the palace, and we'll see that as soon as it happens. Jeremy, in the meantime, Jeremy. No, Kimmock is here, as is uh, Lord Attenborough now. Um, are you moved by all of this, Lord Attenborough? <laughs> I'm moved by everything, Jeremy. I know. As you know, I could be in floods of tears any minute. <laughs> Do cry, feel yeah. free. <laughs> <laughs> May I take advantage of this situation? I was very interested to hear Jim talk about Neil. And uh, I have known him for a long time. And I was very happy last night at uh, um, Festival Hall um, when... Tony mentioned Neil in relation to this victory. And I so, I'm, Jim knows uh, a great deal about it, and I only know it from the margins and as an onlooker. There's no question whatsoever, in my own opinion, of our having achieved this victory in 97 if it hadn't been for Neil's courage and determination in leading up to 92. And it is very sad, as Jim said that we didn't make it in 92, but it was too soon. We, things happened too quickly, they weren't prepared enough. But this election owes its existence, or success in this election, and I'm sure Tony would be the first person to say so, really to Neil, for all that he did. And it gives me great pleasure, publicly, to be able to say that. Thank you, Dick. Sir, I'm sorry, you were saying. Tony Blair, Blair, Blair coming, coming out with Cherie in Islington, without his children, on his way to the palace. Harold Wilson took his children to the palace. It seems Tony Blair is keeping them out of the limelight. Waving to them up there, wearing a blue tie. He's been asked all through the campaign why he's wearing the colour tie he's wearing. He says he just takes them out of the drawer in the morning. There was a nice cartoon of Peter Mandelson inside the drawer, handing out the right coloured tie. So, there he is. The youngest Prime Minister for a, many a long day and the youngest Labour Prime Minister we've had. And uh, Lord Callaghan watching those scenes, what do you get a feeling of? of? Optimism, I suppose, at this stage and a huge burst of energy, it seems. But I think realistic optimism, because I think Tony Blair has been realistic throughout the whole of it. What I, uh, what I have is a feeling of great envy because, you see, as you say, he's the youngest Prime Minister, only 43. I, alas, was 64 when I became Prime Minister. So if that's any encouragement to John Major, then uh, maybe he won't want to resign straight away. we will get a hard fight. Well, he's looking exuberant this morning. Last night, or very early this morning, at dawn at the Festival Hall, he gave a political speech to his supporters, but now some of the sort of natural delight in the victory seems to be coming through. Well, I hope he'll relax a bit now, you know. I mean, what he should do is get the cabinet appointed, and that takes a certain amount of time. And after that, uh, he won't have been given any files yet. I mean, somebody may say, uh, given him a, Robin Butler's given him a file, perhaps so. After that, he can sit back and say, now, lads, get on with the job, and I'll sit and think for a bit. And he, uh, he can then sit back and take his time, in my view, 
before he's really got to rush into it. You have a wonderfully laid back idea of what it's like to be Prime Minister. I mean, I have a well, picture of Tony Blair sort of going in there like a beaver and um, almost a control freak over policy well, after the discipline he's had to impose on the party. Well, I know that's been the system and of course the, the media are awfully bad at this because they try to work everything up so that you do have to take instant decisions. If he's uh, sensible, and I know he is, he will sit back a bit and refuse to be pinned down by clever people like you, David, uh, as to what he's exactly going to do and how he's going to do it. He's got out of the car at the end of the road and is greeting well-wishers who come there to see him. It's always a great moment. A huge enthusiasm there. Jeremy Vine is down there watching these scenes. As you can see, Jeremy? extraordinary. Thank you, David. As you can see, at the end of his row, Mr. Blair's cars, his cavalcade, began moving. A lot of family members here. They're going to a Downing Street lunch, by the way. But then the cars all stopped and the doors flew open and Mr. Blair jumped out. And one of the people who's uh, protecting him there, incidentally, is Mr. Major's security man who's just been transferred. Another point is that Mr. Blair already has Mr. Major's car. It's come to him early. So they're now just negotiating how to get back into it with uh, more of a, a mess of cameras than we ever saw during the election campaign, I should say, when all minders were on hand to keep them at a distance. But uh, as you can see, a really big crowd, a really enthusiastic crowd as the car horns beep and the cars just nose their way through them and out of Mr. Blair's street. There's been quite a number of people behind the doors of Mr. Blair's home here in Islington. Uh, family members, Cherie's parents, Tony and Gail, uh, as you said, uh, Mr. Blair's father, Leo, and others, of course, the staff, Alistair Campbell, Jonathan Powell, and others who we mentioned earlier. And they're all now heading away from Islington and toward the palace. Good, well, we'll pick up the Blair cavalcade as he gets there. Lord Callaghan, do you see any similarities between Harold Wilson, when he became Prime Minister in 64, he was a young man too, wasn't he? He was only 48, I think, when he became Prime Minister. Yes, and, no, I don't, see, I don't see many similarities. I think that Tony Blair has reinvented the party. Uh, there are new layers of society and new layers of the community who've come into the party who weren't there when we were a, 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 a much more of a trade union class-dominated party than we are today. And what Tony, and what Tony Blair has recognized uh, is that he is trying to embrace the whole community. And I think that's absolutely right for us to do today because it's clear that the responsibility falls on the Labour Party now until the Conservatives can sort themselves out and perhaps on after that. And do you think those changes will stick? I mean, you were very much a friend of the trade unions in the, in the Labour Party. I still am, I hope. And you must have been surprised at the, at the changes that have happened and the speed with which they happened. Do you think that... Yes. They're, they're... I, I, I had to adjust myself to that, to thinking about the trade unions in a different way. Um, I have done so with some difficulty because you can't escape from your own background. And I was brought up in the days when we talked about the Osborne Judgment and the Taft Vale Railway, which nobody ever talks about now. I was a real son of the trade union movement, which has done wonderful work and still has wonderful work to do. But I think what has happened now is that the trade union leaders, who were rather weak in the 70s, some of them incidentally, have got back to the kind of situation that existed in the late 40s and early 50s, when the trade union movement would not attempt to dictate the policy of the Labour Party. And they were content to make their own representations. Of course, they had a great input on policy. But there used to, there used to be a very rigid division in what you could discuss, for example. The shadow cabinet would not discuss trade union affairs. Uh, and, and the trade union movement would not then discuss very awkward political issues. That each side had its own responsibilities. We got away from that over a period of years, I think basically in the 60s. And now I think as a result of Tony Blair's stand and the trade union understanding of what went, they went through with Mrs. Thatcher and so on, that both sides have now got a much more sensible idea of what ought to be done. But when you, look, when you look back, do you think that you were on the wrong side in the great debate over trade union reform and by opposing it delayed the country's acceptance of the Labour Party? Do you think Labour could have been in well, office longer if you hadn't felt so strongly about I, I, the reforms? I've, I've thought about that because I suppose I had a lot of responsibility for what happened in 1968. But I think, frankly, the kind of reforms that were put forward then would not have achieved the purpose 
Um, we were talking about unofficial strikes and all the rest of it then. And I had a strong belief, and I regret so much that I have been proved to be wrong. I had such a strong belief that in a democracy, the trade union movement ought to revise itself and ought to reform itself. We're following Tony Blair's car down through King's Cross, the area of London that he says when he was talking about homelessness, it embarrassed him to take his children through sometimes. And uh, he goes through King's Cross towards the Euston Road, quite a long journey from Islington. Luckily, his children will be at school nearer to Downing Street now. They move to the oratory school. He won't have to go to the local school in Islington, so they'll be better off in Downing Street, as it turns out. So it wasn't a bad choice after all. And he well, heads if, down there with the police escort again. Mind you, if he was sensible, he, would, he, he wouldn't let Gordon Brown have number 11. He'd take it himself. Because I, I always thought the apartments in number 11, and I lived in both, were much better than those in number 10, which is purely an office, as I've said. Number 11 is a home to live in. Uh, so I give him, that's the only piece of advice I'm going to offer him. Move into number take, 11. Yes, boot Gordon Brown out of number 11 and take it yourself. Well, there, there was talk about uh, number 11, the, the, the walls being knocked down because Gordon Brown being at present at any rate, a single man didn't need all the space. <laughs> and, and the Blairs might move, the move, move across, but I don't know whether that will yeah. happen. We've got, uh, we've got scenes of uh, the car on its way down to Buckingham Palace from our motorbike. We'll keep track of that as it gets closer to the palace. It's now going to go into the traditional Euston Road jam and we join Jeremy Paxman. Jeremy. Neil Kinnock, when you uh, look at those scenes and see the actual taking of power, it's presumably everything you work for, isn't it? Oh yes, it is certainly and I would very much like to have been able to do what Tony is doing now, but it wasn't to be and it would be stupid for me to dwell on that. I must say that such is my delight. Not only that we've won and won so spectacularly, but that he's won, mm. that it completely obliterates any lingering feelings I've got about that. Now, Lord Attenborough, you said before the election that you thought you would die if, uh, if Labour didn't win, so I suppose Tony Blair saved you for the nation. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, aspic. <laughs> but, I mean, you were one of the people who went over to the SDP. You left the SDP before many people really took up with, with new Labour. Uh, what was it about the, this new party you saw being created? Man, uh, of new Labour, you mean? Oh, I, I think that... I have, to, I have to go back to the Tories, really. What I don't think the Tories have grasped is that they present a whole series of statistics and figures demonstrating to us in theory, or maybe correctly, partially, that we are all very well off. That, uh, this terrible phrase that they've used on these posters, Britain is booming. Right. Sorry. I'm going to interrupt you there, yeah. David. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. This is the outside declaration of Brecon and Radnorshire. Peter Radnisher. Evans, official Conservative and Unionist Party candidate, 12,419. This is the announcement of the Liberal Democrat victory in Brecon and Radnorshire. It means there are Richard no Tories Arthur now Lloyd in Dizzy, Wales. Liberal and the announcement Democrat, was made in Welsh first. And there's Richard Livesey who takes the seat. He was the MP here from 1985 to 1992, won it in a three-way by-election back in the mid-80s. Former leader of the Welsh Liberal Party. Christopher John Mann, the Labour Party candidate. So out in the sunshine at Brecon, they give the result. And let's just have a look at the raw figures here. 17,500 for Roger Livesey, a majority of 5,000, a gain from a tiny majority last time on these new boundaries. 130 was the Conservative majority for Jonathan Evans. So that is the last of the Welsh seats to declare, and it leaves the, well, the, uh, the Tory party wiped out in Wales, Peter, isn't that right? Yes, I mean, absolute wipeout. There's the picture in 1992. For the last five years, there have been eight Conservatives in Wales, including Brecon and Radnor, that great slab of blue there in the middle. Conway, Vale of Conway, all these seats up here, Vale of Clwyd. And here we have the picture today. Just look at the change. No blue on the map at all. The Liberal Democrats have one more seat in Wales now, Brecon and Radnorshire. Labour have seven more seats in Wales, 34, 34 seats uh, out of the total uh, of 40 seats in Wales. 
down the Conservatives down eight seats in Wales. And here then is the picture, 1955, uh, Anthony Eden had nearly all the seats in Wales, 36 of them. There's uh, Edward Heath, October 1974, with 16 of them. 1979, Margaret Thatcher had 22. Then she was down to 10 in 87. In uh, 1992, uh, John Major had only 11 of the Welsh seats, and now John Major's party has none. David. Thanks very much, Peter. Well, we're watching the helicopter shots of uh, Tony Blair on his way to the palace, reaching a more salubrious part of London than King's Cross now. Not quite sure what route they're taking, and I have to confess I can't quite recognize where they've got to from this top shot. Not a view you often see. I think they're coming down towards the Mall, Southampton Row, they're coming down, I think. That's right. They're coming down to the end of Oxford Street, I'm told. Well, the geography eludes me for the moment. Anyway, the car is on its way, and while we wait for it to get a little bit closer to Buckingham Palace, let's just have a reminder of the state of the parties and an apology, incidentally, about not having a news bulletin at 12. These events have overtaken it. We'll be with the news bulletin later after 635 results. Labour 418, up 145. The Conservatives on 161, down 176. A majority of 177 predicted for Labour over all other parties. The Liberal Democrats on 45, up 27. Nationalists on 10, up 3. And John Major speaking in Downing Street an hour or so ago, saying when the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage, and that is what I propose to do, uh, saying that he would leave the leadership, but at a time that suited the party as a whole. Paddy Ashdown for the Liberal Democrats said, John Major is a decent and honorable man, leading a truly dreadful party, and he's done his best with it. And Peter Mandelson, Labour's campaign manager, considering what his party has done to him, John Major has emerged with dignity. And on this program a moment ago, Lord Callaghan, former Prime Minister for Labour, said to me, this is like 1945 with spades. I'm delighted I've lived to see it again. Not only lived to see it, but lived to come into the studio and talk about it to us, and very good it is to have him with us. Looking down again then over London, we see the uh, cavalcade of cars with its police escort for the new Prime Minister, Tony Blair, still on its way down towards Buckingham Palace. Not far to go now. And uh, various, view, uh, various versions of where we are. I think only a helicopter pilot or um, maybe somebody coming in regularly on a 747 gets this kind of view of London, coming down St. Martin's Lane and down towards Trafalgar Square. Tell me a story, Lord Callaghan. I remember, of course, this moment very well. But what always struck me there was I desperately eager to get to the palace and to get on with it. And uh, Martin Charters, who was the Queen's private secretary and a man of very great and wry humour, telephoned me when I was at home and said, the Queen would like to know when it will be convenient, convenient for you to come to the palace. <laughs> <laughs> I was ready to grab a car straight away. <laughs> because that's not how she treats everybody, because there was, a, there was a, um, an occasion when, I think it was Ted Heath's election, wasn't it, when she was at Ascot. Do you remember? Oh, yes. And the Queen, will, the Queen was not going to have Ascot interrupted for you wretched politicians. Uh, well, that is absolutely right. I, and that is, why do you think the garter service is fixed for when it is and all those other celebrations around that time? Well, now down in Tra Trafalgar Square, and he's coming towards the top end of the Mall, We've temporarily lost sight of the car. There it is. You can see the police escort and the traffic being stopped either side. And going through Admiralty Arch and down into, uh, down under the archway and down the Mall to Buckingham Palace. Because of uh, these events, we're not going to have the usual regional programs at this stage. There'll be later on the half-hour specials. We'll follow the one o'clock news because we're watching these unique pictures of the moment when, after 18 years of Conservative government, a young Labour Prime Minister comes after a staggering victory at the polls yesterday. 
down to Buckingham Palace to receive the seals of office as Prime Minister. And once again, the bands are still going about their business on this beautiful early summer day, I think you must call it, May the 2nd. Often it's wet here in London, but the last weeks of this campaign have seen, at least in the south of England, the most brilliant, hot, sunny weather. And this could be the first day of June rather than the first day of May. So here for a brief meeting with the Queen and then back for the first time to number 10 Downing Street and for the first announcements of cabinet appointments. Tony Blair with a majority of 179, the largest Labour vote ever. The Tories reduced to a rump party on a scale and with a popular vote that hasn't been seen since the Duke of Wellington, I think that's right, David Canadine, in 1832, just after the Great Reform Act. Yes, this is a, a most extraordinary election in the sense that there is no 20th century precedent for this outcome. Uh, there have been great victories of radical and liberal parties before this century, three of them in fact to be precise, but none on a scale to equal this. This is a most extraordinary result without any precedent in anyone's lifetime today. But of course it may differ from other radical victories in that this may not be in the eyes of the electorate or the minds of the electorate a radical victory. It may be an anti-Tory victory as we've been saying earlier on. That could be true, but radical victories tend to be anti-Tory, even though anti-Tory victories don't always have to be radical, and we still can't yet know exactly how this is going to work out. And of course we don't know the nature of the radicalism, because what uh, Tony Blair has said that he, is that he'll be more radical than people think. I don't know what Lord Callaghan thought of that remark, if you read it in the newspapers when he made it, in the Observer. Well, I suppose it is radical, obviously it's radical if you propose to uh, reform the House of Lords or make major changes there. Uh, if you are going to introduce a bill on human rights, uh, if you are going to have devolution in the United Kingdom for the first time, oh, this is very radical. But more radically said than people think, which, uh, well, we shall see. Anyway, well, there I, he yes, is, I, turning I, I... into the forecourt of Buckingham Palace. Well, this must be a very, both a very nerve-wracking and a very proud moment for Mr. and Mrs. Blair, after all the battles, to be coming here to be appointed Prime Minister. That's the last we see of them for the moment, as they go inside to the private apartments. Well, so what, what happens then? Well, it's very informal. Jim, if I might call you that. Of course you may. David, if I may call <laughs> you that. Um, of course, uh, um, the, the, the private sector stands at the door and ushers you in, and you then have a private conversation with the Queen, I'm sure she won't say to Mr. Blair on this occasion, do you think you can form a government? <laughs> I guess she will take that rather for granted. But what she may talk to him about is when should, would he come back again with the cabinet? Because they'll have to swear the oath of allegiance. And that is the formal occasion. Uh, there will be nothing more than shaking hands now and uh, some private conversation. And then the great moment comes when he takes the cabinet back and they're all given a testament. Uh, inscribed with the date on which they were sworn of the Privy Council. I still have mine. There was a period when they went, became rather mean. Uh, and um, I think it was about 74. And you were told if you were given the testament, you had to hand yours back uh, after you'd had the ceremony. But I'm told that that has now been reversed and they can keep their testaments. And of course, it's a very proud thing to have. I've kept mine and uh, got it inscribed properly. I know you won't say about private conversations, but did you get help from the Queen when you were Prime Minister? I mean, when you, when you went in there, did she give you tips about how to do it? No. Um, I was uh, so arrogant that I thought I knew how to do it anyway. Uh, after all, I had sat in the, in, in the Cabinet room at times since 1947. Now, it's 50 years ago since I first went into the Cabinet room. Uh, so she didn't give me tips on how she thought I ought to do it. More importantly, um, I valued her advice very much on one or two particular problems. Um, when uh, we talked about things and, uh, and I said, uh, well, there, there were occasions when she did and there was one famous occasion when she didn't. And I, I explained to her what the nature of the problem was. And I said, what would you do? And the Queen looked at me and said, you're paid for doing that. <laughs> You won't tell us what the difficult no. decision was, I suppose. No. No? <laughs> Lord Callahan, thank you very much. Peter Snow.
David, no sooner had I sat down after telling about the Conservative MPs in Wales, that Neil Kinnock waved at me and said, you've got it completely wrong, you're showing the figures for Scotland. He's quite right, our computer got very overexcited overnight and has come up with the wrong figures. Here, is the, here are the figures for the Conservatives in Wales, of course. Uh, Anthony Eden had only six MPs uh, in Wales in, in 1955. It mounted to 79 under Margaret Thatcher, and it, 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 11 MPs in 1979. Now it's down to none under John Major over here. So we got it completely wrong. Many apologies. David. Thanks very much, Peter. Well, now, Sue Cameron is up at Richmond, where William Hague is waiting for his count. You've lost him, I gather. Um, yes, we have. He uh, seems to have gone to ground. We are still waiting for his uh, count to be finished. But he, uh, he said that he is not going to be talking particularly about the leadership for this weekend. He's going to have a quiet weekend. He was, of course, uh, earlier this week, certainly, I think, joint favourite at uh, three to one with the bookies to become uh, the next uh, Tory leader, should things go badly wrong. He himself is sticking very firmly to the line that what the party needs is a period of quiet conversation contemplation. But of course he knows and everybody else knows that that quiet contemplation is going to be accompanied by some thoroughgoing butchery. And there are some Tories who are saying that William Hague, who's very young, only 36, that what he should do is to stay right out of the, uh, the bloodbath that's likely to come about and maybe later when it's all over, when things are beginning to calm down, he would then come through the middle as somebody who could appeal both to the right and the left, which is going to be the big problem with the other main contenders, that the right-wingers are not going to want the likes of Ken Clark but, and vice Sue, versa. But Sue, is there going to be time for that? Because it seems from what John Major was saying, the implication is he'll want to go by about sort of the end of July, so that this would be a run that William Hague would have to make within a month or two. It's not a matter of waiting till the party conference in the autumn. No, perhaps not. It might, but I still think that uh, some people are saying he would be still be well advised not to uh, put his hat in the ring or to look too keen too early on. That uh, if he if he let things go for as long as possible, he would be in a stronger position. Particularly as he does seem to be the person who is most likely to be able to appeal to both the uh, the right. He worked for a while for uh, Norman Lamont as his PPS and also to the left wing of the party. Of course he got engaged during the campaign so maybe he should get married before the leadership battle starts. Well yes I think uh, getting engaged certainly uh, might help him. He's uh, engaged to uh, uh, the girl who was uh, teaching him Fion, the girl who was teaching him uh, Welsh when he was uh, Welsh secretary and perhaps uh, who knows a wedding might uh, be a good way to uh, start the unofficial campaign. In Yes Minister they always say that you should pretend that you're not campaigning if you want to be Prime Minister. Sue, thank you very much indeed. Um, Peter, who, who does the, you've got figures on who the public wants to succeed, yeah, for once, the leadership there, of, the, of the Conservative Party. Well, well, he was talking there, just digging up out of our uh, exit poll analysis of what people were saying about uh, the future Tory leadership. If John Major does now go, oh, what, we asked them, uh, would they like to see in the way of leader? A leader for the Tory party. And Michael Hazeldine scored the best with 23%, uh, then Kenneth Clark with 15%, John Redwood, 8%, Michael Hard, 4%. Michael Portillo and uh, uh, Haig and a few others got one or two percentage points, not very many, but someone else, 30%, said, no, none of them, somebody else, please. So clearly very muddled and not very excited about the prospect of any of the potential uh, candidates for leader. Michael Hesseldine, the best, but not very convincingly, David. So anybody called someone else wins Indeed. Really, on that basis <laughs> at the moment. And, and he, he's not there at all, the fellow we were talking about, William Haig. No, he, he had about 3%, but he three, just, he he just, he just drops out of three, your scene. He just, well, he wasn't, he wasn't fit him on, right, but he's, okay. he's there. He's there. Portillo had a few marks as well, but uh, Nick, Ro Nick Robinson is in Smith Square at Conservative Party headquarters. Nick, um, very, very empty scene behind you there compared with what it's been during the campaign, but what's the drift of things? Well, it was a veritable hive of activity this morning. You couldn't keep cabinet ministers away from a microphone or a camera telling us how dignified John Major had been and how they thought he was quite right not to rush in a, into a decision. As soon as he'd taken a decision, they've rushed away because they don't want to seem to be looking for this leadership contest too early. So they've all gone away, they've turned their bleepers and their mobile phones off and each of them is going to wait for the other to make the first move because none of them want to be seen to be welcoming this defeat as a personal opportunity for themselves. Well, somebody will have to break for cover. I mean, John Redwood's appearing on programmes over the weekend. I think he's appearing on any questions tonight. I think the weekend's the key to this. John Redwood, yes, he's come out before the others, and in a sense, he wants to set the terms for this debate. He's done an article in the Evening Standard, and he's appearing on any questions well, what this do, evening. What does he say in the Standard article? 
Well, the interesting aspect of it, some of it's entirely predictable. Europe, he says the party should rule out the single currency. Uh, but what's most interesting about it is how all these candidates on the right now have to appeal to the centre. John Redwood's way of doing that is to say that voters clearly wanted, when they voted Labour, increases in spending on health and education, and that the Tories didn't properly address that. So Redwood's pitch will be, I may be the right winger on the Constitution and on Europe, but I will deliver what voters want on public services. And what about the other candidates? Do you have any inkling what they'll say? The ones who are Stephen Dorrell, for instance, is not likely to keep his powder dry for long. No, I think what you'll see is they line up on these Sunday interview programmes and possibly in the Conservative supporting Sunday newspapers to outline their agenda for the future. But what's interesting in a sense here is that all the candidates, bar Kenneth Clark, are likely to agree on Europe. And therefore, far from this uh, leadership contest being a divisive debate about Europe, you may find them all trying to outbid each other on some quite unusual things. Public services, taxes, perhaps even the sorts of agendas that Tony Blair focused on in the Labour Party, how to reform the organisation of the party in order to win back those seats that they've lost, Scotland, in Wales, in the inner cities and in the north. So this will be, if you like, a right-wing party having to show each of the candidates that they can pitch to the centre. Nick Robinson, thank you. Well, now the battlefield, Peter. Well, this is a measure of Tony Blair's success, David, as he prepares to take over residence at uh, number 10. This is the staircase that he and the Liberal Democrats had to climb, the vulnerable Conservative seats. All he had to do was not go as far as the mountain strongholds over here, but just to climb up two columns on the left as far as number 57. 57 Labour gains would have been enough. And look what happened. Here they go. Racing up the first column and the second column, a few Lib Dems there as well, and one or two Scottish Nationalists. But just look at Labour's penetration into this uh, battleground here. We just bunch them all together so you can see how many Tony Blair ended up with. Through the winning post, 57, up to 93 here, 100, 117, 134, 150 gains, 167 net gains in this general election. Liberal Democrats taking a few as well. Tories corralled back here on the battleground, just a few at the top. So we've crossed Downing Street here. We can see just what the result of this election is. If I need to tell you again, it's Tony Blair in Downing Street with an overall majority. We can be pretty certain about this exact figure now of 179, the best Labour figure ever. And down at number 10, children outside the door waiting for Tony Blair's arrival here from... Buckingham Palace and his audience of the Queen and when he comes into the top of Downing Street he'll be we think getting out of the car and talking to people in the street looks fine today it is one of the most inhospitable streets in the whole of London freezing wind blows down it in the winter and now of course with the gates at either end you can't get into it except on special occasions like this Neil Kinnock always said that if he became Prime Minister he'd take those gates down and I don't know whether Tony Blair will do the same thing. May have to be there for security reasons, but it's a great pity people used to be able to walk up and down outside the Prime Minister's house with impunity. Hugh Edwards is there in Downing Street this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. Uh, Hugh, who exactly has been allowed into Downing Street for this greeting of uh, Tony Blair? Well, they look like ordinary members of the public, David. Many of them, some of them are, but I can spot lots of Labour Party workers, some people there from the press and media office down in Millbank Tower, just along Millbank, not uh, too long a walk from Downing Street itself. As you can see, they're hanging off the Treasury building, they're hanging off the Foreign Office building, they're looking down into Downing Street, and you're absolutely right, it's a very rare, it's a very enjoyable scene, simply because we don't see Downing Street crowded like this anymore, simply because the gates are there for understandable security reasons. There and you see that gentleman, two gentlemen outside the door of number 10, very heavily protected, a reminder of the kind of times we live in. And what is the procedure once Tony Blair gets back here to number 10, or gets here for the first time, I should say, to number 10? We expect some special scenes, not least because I think we'll find he will not drive up to the door, as many have done in the past, he will, in fact, probably get out at the gates and do an historic walk up through Downing Street, shaking hands. You can just imagine what kind of a reception he'll get from this crowd. They're not just Labour workers, they're not just professional party workers. Lots of them are there as Labour supporters, not professionally committed people. He will have a tumultuous welcome. Well, he will walk up. He won't he be able get... to get through at the moment because there is the ramp 
That's right. The security that's ramp that's built in the road to stop I cars going across. I think it's a safe bet that will be lowered, David, but he'll step over it if it's not. And what about when he gets into number 10 itself? What's the procedure there? He will be taken in by Alex Allen, his principal private secretary, the man he's inherited from John Major. He will introduce him within the hallway of number 10 to dozens and dozens of the permanent staff at Downing Street. The tradition is that they welcome and applaud a new prime minister as he crosses the threshold. That's what will happen. He'll be taken in. He'll be taken down the line of people and introduced to the individuals by Alex Allen. He'll get to the bottom of that famous corridor. There's a big white door at the bottom with a huge brass handle. That is the door to the cabinet room. Outside that room will stand Sir Robin Butler, the secretary to the cabinet, the boss of the civil service, the man who will work closely with Mr Blair to ensure that his Queen's speech I think, is uh, realised. I, I think Lord Callaghan is looking very nostalgic at the thought of turning up at number 10. Do you remember when you went through that door? Not when you went into the cabinet room, but when you met the staff for the first time and how you were welcomed by them? Yes, they clapped me in. Uh, of course, I've been a member of the cabinet for so many years that um, I knew a lot of them and, uh, and they were friends and have remained friends ever since. Um, and you just walk uh, very informally down the corridor to the cabinet room uh, and they're either ready to come in with you or to stay outside and I ask them to stay outside for the moment. Of course in your day it was free access to number 10 wasn't it? There was Absolutely. none of this. Uh, I mean, this is really yeah. quite a rare occasion. Now, when I was Chancellor, there. you know, um, and we devalued the pound, there were a small group of young Conservatives who used to stand outside number 11 every night. And I used to walk to and fro between the house and number 11. And when I got there, uh, outside, they would shout at me, resign, resign. And then they would raise their bowler hats and say, good night, Mr. Callaghan, and go <laughs> off home so politely. It was very nice. We got quite friendly. <laughs> Well, I think some of that has gone from British politics, hasn't it? I think it has, uh, and it's a great shame. I think people were rather more relaxed then, but you must remember that in those days, especially as a result of the war, and the impact of the war hung on until the 1960s, there was basically a consensus, you know, between the two parties, although they didn't recognize it. There was a consensus about objectives, about full employment, and about various other things. I think that that disappeared, frankly, as the wartime generation started to fade out. Those people had worked together. We knew each other or we'd been in the forces or something together. And I wish we could get back to it because ba I hope this is where Blair will be successful. That this country works best when there is a basic agreement about objectives. And that's what we ought to aim at and that's when this country will go forward fastest. So you don't think that this talk about uh, bringing people together is is just sort of political hype. You think he really seriously means something I, by I it? I don't think it's guff. I, I think that he wishes to do this and it will of course infuriate the party enthusiasts or some of them and people who were rather short-sighted. But if he can get a measure of agreement and after all when you see a man like Richard Branson on the television with him um, it does mean there's a new group of people who have been attracted to the Labour Party. Now, obviously, there are a lot of them that will be in the Conservatives. And I think we really ought to have this division, frankly, and not the, uh, when I say division, I mean uh, of people voting, not be out of pure class. I was always objected to that. Let's just have a look, thank you very much, Lord Callaghan, at the state of the parties at this stage. It's uh, just coming up to 10 to 1. And we've had 635 declarations now. We only have 24 left to come. Labour, 418, that's the scale of their victory, the size of that tower. Two and a half times, would it be? Three times, nearly? The size of the Conservative vote. There'll be so many MPs for Labour in the new House, they won't all be able to fit on the government benches, and we'll have to go round onto the opposition benches as well. Maybe Tony Blair will put the Labour left round there, and then they can sit where they've sat all the time. Dennis Skinner can remain in situ. Um, there, there, there are the votes. Liberal Democrats, 45, up 27. National Party up three, the Nationalists up three, ten of them all together. That's uh, Plaid Cymru, four, and the Scottish National Party have made all the gains, six of them. And those are their three gains, not Plaid Cymru's. Plaid Cymru's stay at four. Other parties on one. The Conservatives have the lowest number of seats that they've had since 1906 and the lowest popular support since 1832. There are now no Conservative MPs in Scotland and Wales. The Liberal Democrats, by contrast, have the highest number of seats for a third party since 1929. That's the Liberal Democrats 
on 45. John Major, the Prime Minister, said in Downing Street as he left to go to the palace when the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage and that's what I propose to do. Paddy Ashdown, the Liberal Democrat leader, said John Major is a decent and honourable man leading a truly dreadful party and he's done his best with it. And Peter Mandelson, Labour's campaign manager, considering what his party has done to him, John Major has emerged with dignity. And here are the highlights of this extraordinary election, election night and election morning uh, that we've seen. Let's just have a look at what's happened today. Well, the empty forecourt of Buckingham Palace, the uh, Prime Minister's car appears to have vanished for the time being, but Tony Blair is there with the Queen and uh, is being appointed Prime Minister or going through the non-ceremony that leads to his becoming Prime Minister and we'll follow him as soon as he comes out of Buckingham Palace. Uh, we'll be there. Jeremy. Uh, Neil Kinnock, it's interesting, you were very helpfully pointing out who a lot of these people were in Downing Street, MPs, members of the party, supporters and so on. Even the arrival in Downing Street has been fantastically choreographed, right down yes. to the handing out of the flags and everything. Yes, yes it has been. I'm delighted to say that Jan Royal, from my cabinet, my former uh, uh, PA, was the person who choreographed it, as she has so many of the other things that Tony's done during the campaign, and I think that... Uh, I'd like to pay public tribute to her. She's a wonderful woman, and uh, she's done that. But of course, the point is, these are genuine families. Alistair Campbell's kids were there, and it is a real family occasion, which I think uh, is symbolizing something about what's going to be Britain and the Prime Minister Blair. Interesting, Lord Attenborough, to see these, uh, the flag, the other symbols of British nationalism as it were, regained by, uh, by Labour, because we haven't seen that for a long time. They mm. became the property at one time, exclusively mm. almost to the far right. Mm. Interesting, mm. that, isn't it? Yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not against that at all. I mean, I'm against uh, xenophobia, ob obviously, and lunatic patriotism and so on. But I think that what Tony is going to do, and part of his programme, is to try and restore a pride in the country and that the, pr the country can advance as one body as it were. I was saying earlier about this Britain is booming thing. I, I, I wanted to go to the post and say yes for whom? Yes. Because you see I don't, I, I, the condescending thing to do that I think to that particular statement and I don't think the members of the Conservative Party got out and saw the part of the country for whom it was anything but booming. And I don't think they understood that. David? Thanks very much, Jeremy. Well, outside Buckingham Palace, the, uh, they're still waiting for Tony Blair to emerge. And John Burton is in Downing Street. The man we saw last night, Tony Blair's agent, and the man who got him the seat in Sedgefield in the first place, and he's with Hugh Edwards. David, uh, this man is described as Labour's best talent spotter. <laughs> Your thoughts today, Mr. Burton? Oh, it's wonderful. What an exciting day. Everybody's happy. There's been a change. I think the pu British public said, you know, enough's enough. We've had 17 years of this lot. Let's have a change. Let's have somebody new with some vision, a new Labour for the new millennium. 
and even the taxi driver was singing when we came down here, so it, it's wonderful. When, on that fateful day in 83, you decided that Tony Blair was the man for you in Sedgefield, you can't in a million years have imagined you'd be here today. No, no, everything's just happened so quickly. I mean, we thought he was somebody special and that, you know, he was certainly cabinet material, but of course, if it wasn't for certain, so in some cases, sad uh, reasons with John Smith, uh, it's happened so very, very quickly. Now, one would understand if he was overwhelmed by the occasion. Certainly, he made an emotional speech last night, first of many. What was he like in person, in private, when you spoke to him? What did he say? I think he was very gracious. I think he understood how the job and the task, and uh, he was very grateful to the British people. And in terms of this morning, how much contact have you had with him? What have I, haven't, you I haven't really, no. We've been in and out of television studios, and uh, I haven't seen him this morning, but I look forward to having a word with him. Up in Sedgefield itself, in Trimden, we saw the pictures oh, last night. Magic. Tell us a little bit about the events there. Well, the, the, it's been centred around the Labour Club and uh, the whole village turned out. The people were coming from near and far and uh, trying to stay the night in the village. People who didn't have accommodation and uh, the club was open through the night. It was just wonderful. And who have you come down today with? With the people who were first there when, uh, when Tony was uh, selected, really. The people who did the work. And in terms of the group here, you begin, will you be going inside? What are the plans? I'm not sure, really. We'll have to wait and see. Probably, probably we'll go some other time. I mean, today is rather a special day for him and the family, I think. And do you expect him to get down to work? Straight away. Straight Thank away. Thank you very much. Back to you, David. And at that moment, Cherie Blair coming out of Buckingham Palace with the Prime Minister, now appointed. Lady in waiting, Lady Susan Hussey on the left there. Saying goodbye, as having escorted them down the stairs. Lady Susan Hussey, wife of the former chairman of the BBC. And the Prime Ministerial car now drives off, and so begins from this moment a new premiership under Tony Blair with a remarkable victory for Labour. He leaves here and from this moment on, the work and the responsibility starts. And they're not all American tourists. Some of them have come there because they knew that it was going to be Tony Blair, a new Prime Minister coming out, so he gets applause as he turns out into the mall. Well, Neil Kinnock, who could have been there, is watching this. Mr Kinnock, what are your feelings as you see this great moment unfold for Tony Blair? Pure delight. Pure delight? Yeah, if I can coin a phrase, it couldn't happen to a nicer bloke. <laughs> <laughs> I am I'm thrilled, obviously, for my party and, and for our country. But I'm particularly pleased because it's him. He is a remarkable young man. I wrote him a letter this week. <clears throat> We've had an exchange of letters throughout the uh, campaign. And I concluded it uh, simply by saying that I wanted to send my love to him and to Cherie on their great adventure. Well, now it's started. And it is a great adventure. And they'll do our country proud. So the Prime Minister goes down past horse guards and will turn into number 10. St. James's Park on the left. And uh, I'm not quite sure once again of the route that he's taking here. I think he'll come out at the bottom towards Parliament Square. past the Treasury building and there's the turning on the left there that goes into Horse Guards straight on down towards Parliament Square Treasury building there on the top of the picture where key powerful figures will be waiting to speak to him no doubt pretty much within the hour and turns up Whitehall pictures from our helicopter there 
Winston Churchill's statue coming into view. Other important figures in British public life in the square there. And he turns up into Whitehall and then we'll go left into Downing Street. And there we expect him to get out of the car and meet the large crowd of well-wishers who've come there. And then I hope he'll follow what has become a tradition and speak on the steps of number 10 before he goes into his new home. The one o'clock news is uh, temporarily delayed while we follow these live news pictures of the biggest story in Britain at the moment and the uh, one o'clock news will follow once uh, he's gone inside number 10 Dining Street. So it may be a few minutes more as the police escort finds a way up the center of the traffic there, pushing people to one side and holding it up so that the prime ministerial car can get through. He's got a fairly heavy schedule, not only making his cabinet appointments, but within a couple of weeks or so, he has to have prepared the legislation for the Queen's speech and the state opening of the new parliament. There's the budget that's been promised in July, so that uh, the time he has to relish the excitement of this moment is rather limited. All his thoughts must already be on the priorities that uh, face him key choices in the formation of the cabinet, key decisions to be make with, made with uh, his new Chancellor of the Exchequer about the economy, the opening of the books as it's called, though they've adopted the Treasury plans as they stand at the moment, they may want to re-examine those. So there's a very heavy agenda and uh, only a brief time to enjoy this moment, but for the moment he is there to enjoy it, and a huge crowd surging forward. He gets out of his car at the entrance to Downing Street. And a big crowd surging across Whitehall to his car, with the police trying to hold them back. <laughs> 